He says, and uh, he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I want to just think about that verse there as it just describes the condition of this end times government or nation, if you will, of devils. Now we can understand the Bible when it says devils, it's talking about demons, right? Or, or evil spirits. And as the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, we can understand that saying the same thing there. And it says the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. What in the world is that all about? Where does that come from? What's What's the birds? Uh, well, this speech, the, the terminology and the, the pictures that are used in this, we actually find similar things all throughout the Bible. And it's really interesting when you study prophecy to see like over and over in the Bible, we see some of the same types of judgments being poured upon evil nations, and usually the enemy of God's people, and then the wrath is poured out upon those nations. And a lot of times the prophecies that are given in the Old Testament are dealing with a particular nation in that time, but there's a much farther extending prophecy that's being made in regards to that final nation, the end and the destruction of that final nation that we read about in the book of Revelation. But let's look and see the similarity of speech here in Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, and starting in verse 19, we'll read about this judgment that's being cast upon, and it mentions Babylon. Okay, uh, again, Babylon of that time, quite a bit different than the Babylon that's talking about in Revelation, because really Babylon, in a, in a way, is not even existent today. Okay, that, that right. Babylon has been judged according to these judgments. But we know it's a picture it's a, it, it, of this, this end times Babylon, if you will. But let's start reading in verse 19, Isaiah 13, verse 19. In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. We'll talk a little bit about Sodom and Gomorrah here in a minute. Uh, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Remember, this is all talking about actual, you know, fulfillment of prophecy there, but also a shadow of things to come. Verse 21, but wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. If you look up doleful there, it talks about something that would cause grief or misfortune. And uh, these doleful creatures. And then it says, And owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. Now, if you try to look up, you know, you ever try to look up commentaries and see what people say about the Bible? Sometimes it's, it's just, it's pretty weird, the things that people will, the stories that people want to tell. They want to get into giants and UFOs and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and look, a lot of times it's a lot simpler than they're trying to make it. Well, there's a Greek mythological creature that's called a satire, satyr, however you pronounce that. And if you look it up, there's this guy, and he's hairy, and he's like goat-like features and stuff like that. And he was a mythical creature that we would maybe think of like a, a, a goblin or not, not a goblin. What's the, what's the mythological thing that lived underneath the bridge? And troll. Troll. There we go. Troll or ogre or something like that, right? And so people actually have read that into the Bible and said, well, this is what they're talking about. Now, this is, a, this is a Greek mythological creature that came later on in time. And so I, just because you're reading the Bible and it references this being, the King James translators use this word, and it's like, hey, well, that word is used to mean this mythological creature. It doesn't mean that's what he, mean, what he meant right there. And I think if you, if you understand what he's saying and you look up the origins of that word, what you see is what it's talking about when it says satyr is a wild animal of some sort, okay, not a mythological creature. And even if it was a mythological creature, uh, you know, he'd probably be, he's probably talking about, in essence, just the demons or the devils 
that are there because really a lot of times uh, these uh, false gods are just devils and if you think about what Amen. they were worshiping as far as the idols that they made to these gods and everything a lot of times they did look like a, a mixture of they kind of look like mythological creatures and all that stuff but i think the idea basically here he's just saying wild animals that fits the context of what he's talking about and uh look over at isaiah 34 if you will same kind of speech remember this is the judgment upon the nation he's saying hey it's just going to be inhabited by these owls and these birds and and uh, these wild animals it's all that's going to be there isaiah 34 <clears throat> now this has to be talking about something else because the judgment here is upon all nations it's not upon just uh, babylon but here it says come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people let me see how far i want to read here okay we're going to go to verse 13. let the earth hear and all that is therein the world and all things that come forth of it for the indignation of the lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies he hath utterly destroyed them he hath delivered them to the slaughter their slain shall uh, their slain also shall be cut out and their and, and their stink shall come up out of the carcass and the mountains shall be melted with their blood and all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. Does that sound familiar? Well, that sounds just like uh, Revelation 6 when he's uh, talking about the, you know, the heavens being rolled back as a scroll. Reminds me of a great song too. And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as the uh, falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edomia and upon the people of the curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat and with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats and with fat of kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath sacrificed the Bozra and the great slaughter in the land of Eduma. And the unicorns, now here we go again. Oh, these mythological creatures. And everybody wants to talk about these, you know, Pegasus with the unicorn horn or whatever. Look, it just means an animal that had one horn. <laughs> right? It's a, uh, most, some people would say rhinoceros. I don't know what it was. He's just talking about this animal that has one horn shall come down with them and the uh, bullocks and the bulls and their uh, their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness for it is the day of the lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of zion and the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become burning pitch it shall be not be quenched right uh, uh, night nor day the smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation it shall lie waste none shall pass through it forever but uh no through it forever and ever but the cormorant and the bittern these are a type of birds and if you, you're not sure about that well we keep reading and what's it mentioned again the owl <laughs> okay uh shall possess the seed the owls also and the raven shall dwell in it and he shall stretch it out upon the line of the uh, uh, of confusion and the stones of the emptiness so you see all this speech consistent uh, throughout these prophecies, then we get to Revelation, what's he say? The habit is going to be the habitation of devils. It's going to be the hold of every foul spirit. There you go, these little goat-like creatures that are drunk, <laughs> men that are going around. No, uh, whatever it's talking about, you can get the idea that he's saying this is the end of this judgment, and it's just going to be completely destroyed. It's going to be the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. In other words, that is the dwelling place. That's where they're going to hang out. And there's going to be there. This is the same kind of terminology that people would have been familiar with uh, who had studied the Bible in that time. Okay, so here's the question. Why is Babylon the Great? This nation that's talking about this in world, if you've been following along, this one world kind of government uh, that has has persecuted believers and, and is now just uh, 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 being judged by the wrath of God. What is it exactly that they're being judged of? What is their sin? Okay. So I want to mention three things in this sermon that this na that nation that is referred to here is being judged for. Keep in your mind as I'm going through this about some things that the world is doing today. Now, you most everybody in here is probably familiar with the concept and the possibility of this Babylon that's being talked about. There's a good argument that that is talking about the United States. The United States fits the description of a lot of what we're going to talk about. 
So keep that in the back of your mind. Whether it is or not, you know, there is certainly a one world type government that is that is forming right before our very eyes. Okay. And so uh, here's what the Bible says uh, that we want to talk about. Now, for the sake of uh, creativity, I guess, I try to uh, alliterate <laughs> or uh, make them all start with the same letter. So all these are going to start with P. And the first one is this perversion. Was Babylon the Great uh, being judged for Babylon the Great? What are they being judged for? Perversion. Look at verse 3. We're in Revelation 8, verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Remember, uh, I'm sorry, this is Revelation 18, if you point back there. And so, fornication, this word fornication is being used, and, uh, and it doesn't say adultery. There, it's for some reason it's controversial, but people get mixed up. What's the difference between adultery and fornication? And some have said, well, fornication just includes all sins. Adultery is specifically uh, a husband or a wife cheating on their their spouse. I personally uh, am of the mindset that when it's talking about fornication, it's talking it's not talking about the marriage relationship. When it's talking about adultery, it's talking about uh, sexual sin is committed within the marriage relationship. And I, I preach messages on that. I don't have time to get into all that uh, this afternoon. But I will say a few things about it here in a minute that will help, I think, with this understanding. So uh, in this passage of Scripture, as we're talking about this nation, if you will, we see uh, the word fornication. Right. Or we see the word whore. Well, what's a whore? A prostitute, if you will. Somebody who's selling themselves right. and, uh, and causing... Uh, uh, other people to fall into their sin or whatever. Now, there are times in the Bible where it talks about adultery. Uh, and what I mean by this is even the, uh, there's obviously the physical act, but the Bible even refers to a spiritual type of adultery or a spiritual right. fornication, right. which would be idolatry and going after other gods right. other than the true God. Okay. So James 4.4, 4, for example, says, for, uh, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, Amen. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, Amen. I, might be, I might be overthinking this a little bit, but just hear me out. Okay? Who is he talking to in James 4.4? Believers or unbelievers? Believers. He's talking to believers. And so he's calling them adulterers and adulteresses. Why? Because they're actually believers... They're in a relationship, if you will, with the Lord, right. but they're going after the things of this world. Filthy. Right? Now, that's not going to separate them from their salvation, right. you know, their eternal soul, their eternal life. But that's going to cause, uh, you know, that's, that's adultery. That's a, that's, a, that's a terrible thing. Okay? Now, the word fornication, however, when it's referred to, uh, is, you know, something that, again, is not in the marriage. Now... If you look at the laws in the Old Testament on fornication, now there were some times where where the death penalty was upon it, but it had to do with like, you know, they're lying about it and they're playing the whore or whatever, and it was like an insult to the family, to the to the Israelite uh, families, and so there would be a time for that. But for the most part, fornication, the end judgment wasn't uh, wasn't death like adultery was. For instance, uh, if somebody was caught, you know, and they forced a woman into that relationship, but she didn't, uh, she was kind of, it was kind of consensual or whatever. Well, it wasn't like they were put to death for that, but what actually what happened is he was supposed to go to the father and try to marry her, right, and try to make it right. And that makes sense, right? So, uh, but whenever somebody was in a relationship and then they went after somebody else and it was found out that they had committed adultery, that person was put to death. Amen. Now, some people say, well, that's just so harsh of a thing. Well, get, get the context. Like, now what's that person supposed to do? You're not supposed to divorce in the, about the Bible. I realize in the Old Testament law there was a means for, for divorcing. But look, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to be faithful to this person. And now this person has committed adultery on me. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to be in this relationship all the time. I'm just, like, used up. I'm just tossed aside. I'm nobody. Uh, you know, and, and, and here's what the Bible the law was. That person could be put to death Amen. for committing adultery. Amen. Now that person who was cheated on is free to marry another. <laughs> I mean, that seems like a harsh, 
thing, but, uh, but under the Old Testament law, that's how it all worked out. And so anyway, I'm just trying to help you understand because it helps you when you're studying your Bible and you see fornication and adultery to, uh, to separate those things. Now there's an interesting uh, story here in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, not story, but interesting use of the word. And this is the uh, letters that are being sent to the seven churches. I mean, the whole thing is, but these are specifically addressing each of the seven churches. Chapter 2, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, talking to the church there, and to the, specifically, I think, to the pastor of that church, and he's saying, hey, this is, you know, you represent this church, and here's the message I have. Because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now, you could say, what? Well, it says fornication right there. And it says that his servants are committing fornication. And again, I might be making too much out of this. Forgive me if I am. I hate whenever people do that. But, <laughs> but I'm just kind of stuck in this idea of the fornication versus the idolatry. Well, get this. The prophetess, the Jezebel, if you will, this false prophet, not a Christian, not a saved person, right? We're talking about somebody who's getting others... Uh, to commit whoredom, if you will, but she is a false prophet. You know, we would maybe describe it as, if you're familiar with the doctrine of, she's a reprobate, right? A false prophet who's rejected God and she's going after uh, to make, you know, proselyte these people and to teach these false uh, doctrines. And he's saying, hey, you need to put that woman out of the church and she's causing men uh, to, uh, to fall into sin Amen. with her. Now, I believe that you could look at this as a spiritual fornication or a physical fornication. Because look at the passage again. Uh, verse 18, chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, let me see here. No, I mean verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my spirit, my servant, sorry, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So we see that there's a little bit more than just the physical aspect of fornication. But if you keep reading, I gave her a space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. You see this idea. Now, those, you know, uh, uh, this bed that he's talking about is kind of symbolic uh, of the thing. Well, I think there's a case to be made there of the... Uh, the, the uh, spiritual and the, and the uh, physical aspect. And so when we talk about perversion and we talk about fornication and we talk about idolatry well, in the Bible, sometimes it's spiritual and sometimes it's physical. All right. Now, let's look at our world today. The United States was once like the hotbed of evangelistic churches. I mean, independent fundamental Baptists even. Yeah, you won't find that in the history books, I understand, because... We don't write the history books, <laughs> but uh, you follow back 40s, 50s, 60s, some of the biggest churches in the United States, independent fundamental Baptist churches, you know, some of the biggest Sunday school classes uh, in the 40s, 50s, whatever, independent fundamental Baptist and uh, worldwide evangelism. I'm talking about back in its heyday, the um, uh, Baptist Bible College or Baptist Bible uh, Fellowship, whatever it was, the uh, BBFI, the missions board would send so many people in there. I have a book in my office, a real thick book, back, I think it was in the 80s, actually, and you could go through there, and it lists all the missionaries in the world that was sent out of the BBFI. And there's missionaries everywhere, and that's just the BBFI. There's all these other organizations and people going out independently and everything. But look, we, the United States has sent a lot of missionaries out into the world. And you think, man, we were a Christian nation. One.
what most people thought that we were. I remember the first time, I mean, this is how gullible I was, <laughs> but I remember as a as a, a younger kid just thinking that that was the case. We're a Christian nation, and so God's going to bless America because America is a godly nation and all this kind of stuff. And as I started getting a little older, I realized there's a lot of wicked stuff that goes on in our country. And then, uh, and then got into young adulthood or whatever, and uh, adulthood then had kids, and I was like, you know what? I ought to know more about politics. So I started listening to talk radio and following up on those things, and it happened to be when Obama was running for office. And I remember listening to uh, all the different things, and and I remember uh, following along a little bit and heard this speech from Obama. And Obama said, "We are not a Christian nation," and I remember being offended. And he said, we are a humanistic nation, or something like that. I don't think he said humanistic, but basically all-inclusive. You know, everybody's welcome here, and they can have their religions or whatever. And I thought, well, he's right. And really, quite honestly, we've been that type of a nation throughout most of the history of the United States. It's just that Christians were making more believers, and they're you know, winning souls, and they were teaching, and they are training, and they were, and they were doing all these things. But look, something happened to even the Christians in the United States, and they started going after, you know, other things, even politics. Remember the uh, the the moral majority? You guys remember that phrase? I guess that's probably for some of you all time. The moral majority, and there was like, hey, all these denominations holding hands, and oh, it really doesn't matter what you believe. We just got to get our nation back. And all of a sudden, politics kind of became the god of the evangelicals. And it's like, man, what happened? You're trading in. You know, your worship of God for idols, almost. And then, you know, you could just look at the uh, the spiritual uh, fornication and adultery that's been committed in our in our nation in, in, in spiritually. But then, how about how about physical? How about physically? The perversion in our nation? It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And so, what does it say here in uh, in Revelation 18? In verse 3, here's an interesting thing. It says, uh, 18 verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Again, I'm not trying to make a whole case out of the United States being the actual uh, uh, mystery Babylon, Babylon the Great. But I'm just saying, if you look at the way that the nation is right now, doesn't the United States kind of want to affect the entire world? For us, we we want that we want to be able to tell the rest of the world what to think. And I remember hearing, uh, being shocked, because my fundamentalist brethren are just just loving Trump, and then I like hear out of Trump's own mouth, he's like he has an agenda to make sure that homosexuality is just like spread across the world basically and he was like assigning uh different ambassadors or whatever who were open sodomites and he was assigning them over to these things and i'm thinking the united states which once was known as a christian country i mean there's other countries if you go to a, uh, like india india or, or something like that and you talk to them about christianity they will thank america i mean i've talked to some of them they think that that is we represent christianity because that's what was spread around for so long hey that's in a christian they, that's how they do, you know, this country is a Muslim country, this country is a Christian country, you know. And so some parts of the world still think that the United States is a Christian country. Uh, but then they see all the wickedness coming into their into their lands whenever the people from the United States come right. over. And they're seeing in Hollywood, that's what people see about the United States. They're watching TV, they're watching Hollywood. And so all these nations are trying to emulate the United States. And what they're doing is they're just embracing all kind of filth and, and perversion so i mean there's spiritual perversion there's physical perversion the idea is that god is not happy with it and god is going to judge yeah. it now thank the lord god's people are taken out of it and all of even god's people we live in this world we can be affected by the systems of this world and by the lust of the flesh and the eyes and all we can at this point of the story we're out of here. We're glor we've given glorified bodies. Amen. We're no longer imperfect and part of this world. Uh, we're looking in, right, in Christ's righteousness down upon this earth and saying, God, avenge this. <laughs> you know? and, uh, but what we're seeing here at this time is God pouring out his wrath upon the sins of the, the world. 
that is left here at that time. So the first thing that we see in this text is that this nation is involved in just this mass perversion. Number two, look at verse three again, is uh, I'm going to use the, it's because, sticking with the P's, i got to use P's here. <laughs> it's privilege. That's the word like we get sent around. Uh, white privilege and all this kind of stuff. Like, privilege. Hey, who, who wants to deny that you're privileged if you're a, if you're a citizen of the United States? I don't care what color you are. You're privileged. If you're, uh, if you, I, I believe that. Uh, if you go to any other part of the world, you know what? They want to be like the United States because uh, of our privilege. Okay, verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Look at verse 7. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so to torment and to sorrow, uh, or so much torment and sorrow. He's saying, give her what is worth. That's another story. But I want you to notice the word delicacy. I mean, deliciously. and the, Yeah, and delicacies. And this morning in Sunday school, I was doing, we were trying to do word studies in Sunday school. And a lot of times it'll help me with one of the sermons that I'm preaching throughout the week. And this time, our Sunday school class was helping me with this sermon right here. So I looked up in the Bible and we did a little study on where the Bible talks about dainty, or delicious, or uh, well, we didn't. I used some verses about that, but or uh, delicate, and it's interesting. It's an interesting study. The Bible has a lot to say about that, and what we basically are getting at are like indulging in like uh, pleasurable things. All right. So uh, uh, you know, it's funny because right after the Sunday school class, we have a little break before the morning service, and we all went next door to get donuts. And coffee. Amen. And I said, you know, I'm sick of Folgers coffee. Uh, did my wife remember to bring the beans that I roasted and so I can grind them and I can have a good cup of coffee? And then I realized I just preached on it. <laughs> Living deliciously and, and delicately and dainty and all this stuff. Like, but look, the idea is, and I brought this out in the sermon, there's nothing in the Bible that says, hey, any, having, having something enjoyable or enjoying something that you have in life is bad. That's not the idea. The idea is that when our appetite gets to the point where we will uh, be swayed by those things and they will turn us away from God, which is uh, why we see uh, anger in Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9 says, remove, here's his prayer. Here's what he prayed to the Lord. Uh, you know, he did pray. You know, there's another prayer where he says, uh, enlarge my coast. And so so somebody made a book. What's that guy? Jabez, the prayer of Jabez. Somebody made a book about that. Well, years ago, but it was kind of like republished, and uh, all these preachers started preaching it, and it basically came down to like prosperity gospel, and uh, you just need to pray that God's going to enlarge your coast and give you great riches and all this kind of stuff. Uh, that's not what the prayer was, first of all, but uh, but second of all, let's read this. Is how come you don't have a prayer of anger? <laughs> the, the, how, how, I don't think that book would be a big seller. Okay, the prayer of anger. Here it is, Proverbs thirty, verse eight and nine. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God. He's saying, look, I don't want to be rich or I don't want to, and I don't want to be poor because either of those could cause me to think thoughts that would, lead, that would tempt me to, be, uh, to go against God. And he's like, I want my affection to be on God. Now, I like how Paul said, you know, I, I've learned how to be content in all areas. So if I'm, if I'm doing good, if I'm wealthy, if, if God's given me riches or whatever, hey, I'm happy. I'm going to use those accordingly. If he takes away everything that I have and I'm in prison and I don't have any food, and I, I'm still happy because he's still God and he still knows what's best for my life and he still knows what I need to do. And so this is the idea. But somebody who's just constantly thinking, I need to go after the pleasurable things of this world, and i got to you know, live deliciously and all that, those are the people that are going to be uh, turned aside. Now, I can't help but share this because, this is, to me, this is just really uh, a big uh, eye-opener. But look at Deuteronomy 28. And I've probably shared it before with this group, but I talked about it in Sunday school, and I want to, I want to discuss it again. What do we 
when we think about privilege and just the luxuries that we have in the United States, and and you've heard the comparison here, you you know we we just in our refrigerator and in our cabinets, you think about the spices that we have and the uh, the food that we bought from the grocery store, which in this time they would have said, man, you're eating like a king. I mean, I feel like that sometimes. I mean, I look like a. <laughs> um, I'm eating like a king, man. I, my wife's a good cook. My daughter's a good cook. Uh, we, we got grocery stores in town. I can go buy some food, and we can have some good food. And I'm eating like a king. They put whatever spices in there. I like cumin. That's my favorite spice. And they put a lot of uh, uh, spices in there and make it taste real good. But, you know, and then afterward, bring out some dessert. <laughs> and all the, you know, there's other countries and parts of the world that never could live as luxurious and back in the Bible days man who would have thought that one day they would have all those kind of things right at their local uh, store they don't have to travel across the ocean to go find those things and bring them back to the king or whatever and so if you think about it in the United States we have oh, quite a bit of dainties right in the uh, uh, delicacies let me see here where did I say to turn Deuteronomy 28 and look at verse 53 now you would think somebody who is delicate would be that bad of a that wouldn't be that bad of a thing. In fact, in our in our in our nation, our society specifically, I I, I mean I, I go across the world, I can think of several cultures that are like this, but it's become kind of like a noble thing or a virtuous thing for <clears throat> men to be gentlemen. Now, depending depending on how you define that, I think men ought to be gentlemen. But I'm talking about like, hey, the softer they are, you know, almost like the more righteous they are. You know what I mean? The the more delicate they are, hey, this is a good this is a good person. Well, here's the thing: it seems like these kinds of people would never hurt anybody. Like they're just man, they just right. they're so soft and gentle, they would never hurt anybody. But here's what you're missing: when somebody is delicate, you know what I mean by delicate, right? I'm going to describe, you can't get any better description than one of my three about what delicacy is, uh, being delicate is. But these, when you're only concerned about comfort and, and uh, having you know, your, your desires met and fulfilled and having all the pleasures of life or whatever, that means that you're putting yourself among, among everybody, everybody else. And so actually you become susceptible to doing all manners of evil. Because you are thinking about yourself only, you know what I mean? So look what it says here. Deuteronomy 28, verse 53 starts, and this is gruesome, okay? Excuse me for this, but it's in the Bible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and share it with you. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God uh, hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee, so that the man that is tender among you, oh, he's so tender. He has such a tender heart and very delicate. His eyes shall be evil toward his brother and toward his, the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children. Well, I don't want the flesh of your children. <laughs> Whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left him in the siege, and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in all the gates. And then it tells about the woman, the women. The tender and delicate woman among you. What is, uh, what is delicate? What is tender? What does that look like? Which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicacy and tenderness. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about the princess and the pea. Doesn't even want to touch the ground unless she has some big comfy slippers, you know, <laughs> before she gets... Her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her son and toward her daughter and toward her young one that cometh out from uh, between her feet and toward her children which she shall bear and she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gate. Now this sounds like such a disgusting thing. How could anyone turn to cannibalism? You know, but throughout history, and even we see a few cases in the Bible, throughout history there have been times of famine or, or something you know, somebody's a, a, a castaway, you know, and, and they have to survive. Uh, I was telling them this in Sunday school this morning that 
there was a story I read about this, uh, this Mexican castaway. Okay, this guy is Mexican, he's a fisherman, and he's in a boat, and he had some guy with him that was uh, uh, helping him fish or something like that. And they ended up missing for like a year. And when they came back, only one guy was left, and the other guy, he said, oh, he couldn't make it. You know, I had to live off of fish eyeballs and stuff like that, and this guy couldn't make it, and so I had to cast him overseas. <laughs> the interesting part of the story was this castaway guy was still sort of plump. <laughs> you know, he, he's been missing for a year eating fish eyeballs. Seemed like it would be kind of skinny, right? So the theory is, actually, he probably ate that guy. There's been a lot of stories like that throughout history, and you're thinking, well, who in the world would ever turn and, and, and kind of like that cartoon, you know, the cartoon where, where Daffy Duck or somebody, you know, he's looking at Bugs Bunny and, 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 and they're on a desert island somewhere and all of a sudden he, he starts looking like a, a, a roasted turkey or something, or something like that, you know. Who would ever look at somebody and think like that? No, no, it gets worse. Who would look at their baby and think like that? I, I can about guarantee you there is a lot of women in the United States right now who wouldn't think twice about it? Oh, yeah. He said, no, that couldn't be. Yeah, because why? Because their only concern in their life is themselves. You know, and if, and if abortion doesn't teach you that lesson, what else will? Oh, yeah, this, is in, this is inconvenient for me. This is going to mess up my career. Let me just abort this baby. Right? This is because of the fact, I don't care how delicate the person is or how tender they are, when it comes time to, like, wait, 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 it's either me or this person, that person's got to go, right? So don't be deceived by somebody who's gentle and soft and tender and everything. That doesn't make them a righteous person. In fact, they might be really easy to just kind of turn on you when uh, things get rough. How'd I get off on that? Well, because it was an interesting story to share. <laughs> <laughs> Loving these types of things, the pleasures of this world, they'll cloud your judgment. All right. Now you think, well, how in the world could you ever get even people who claim to be Christians in this world? Because this is what I think Revelation teaches is going to happen. And Jesus taught this in Matthew 24, uh, Matthew uh, uh, 10, I think he talked about it. He says that you Christians will turn over their brothers and their sisters and the, and the mothers will turn over their kids and all this. And, and basically, to save their own life, they'll turn in their family members because they don't want to, you know. And this is what you saw the Jews whenever Jesus came. The Jews were turning on the Christians, and, and, and what was, why were they doing it? Well, because they didn't want their life to be, you know, uh, uh, discomforted, right? Because the, the and it, the, it flat out says that that's why they did that, because they didn't want to cause problems with the Romans and all that kind of stuff. And so, hey, let's just kill this guy, right? Jesus, their Savior, their Messiah. And so, uh, and so this is what happens when we are concerned about the things of the flesh and the delicacies and all what have you. Look at Proverbs 23. I also shared that, uh, I don't know if you ever watched these videos. If you've never seen these, like text me or something, and I'll say, I don't know, maybe you don't even want to think about it. But um, uh, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, the, the God delusion, the atheist. Hawkins, uh, Dawkins. Dawkins, yeah, Hawkins is the other guy. Uh, man, he's got these video, these interviews he did where he is really like defending cannibalism, basically, like saying like, well, maybe if we didn't have this, uh, you know, this these preconceived ideas and it did, it wasn't so disgusting to us because of our, you know, society and all that stuff, maybe it wouldn't be that bad to harvest the bodies and of humans and, and actually, well, because he's an atheist and he's told himself that there is no God and he doesn't have to fear God. And so I don't care, you know, I don't care if you get to that point and all you care is about yourself, you're going to be thinking all kinds of wicked, disgusting things. And uh, I would never, I wouldn't, if I, no, never mind. <laughs> Let's keep going. Proverbs 23. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, Consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. That is a good dieting verse people like to bring up, but it's not really talking about diet. Okay? Here's the point. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eye upon that which is not? 
for riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Meaning he just he's looking to do evil. He wants to do people harm or whatever. So don't eat that bread. Neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou, sh thou hast eaten, shall thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. What he's saying is, look, you, he might have, you know, uh, uh, buttered you up and flattered you and gotten you to eat from his riches and his bread and all that kind of stuff. Man, don't ever fall for that kind of flattery where they just want to show you, like, well, look what you could have. You could yeah. be like me. I mean, there's preachers that use that kind of, you know, don't you want God to bless you with all the blessings that I have? Look, anyone that tries to entice you with riches and, and luxuries and stuff like that, a red flag ought to go up Amen. and be like, something's wrong with this guy. Why is he trying to entice me with riches and all that stuff? That's Amen. not what God promises people. That's right. And so, and so the privilege is actually, can be a bad thing. And it can certainly cloud our judgment. And so that's what we have in our nation right now. Hey, everybody can be bought. You know, it seems like everybody can be bought. Everybody has to get on a certain side. How do I protect my business? And how do I do that? Look, Baptist preachers, you know, I don't want to preach that because I might not be accepted in this fellowship. And I might not be able to preach here. I might not be able to preach there. What are they concerned about? They're concerned about their paycheck. They're concerned about the, the going to the fellowship meetings and rubbing arms with these high-powered guys. They don't care about serving the Lord. I'm not saying they don't at all care about them, but I'm saying that they've been, they've been uh, redirected from following God to, hey, how can I live an extravagant life? How can I have the comforts and the luxuries and all that kind of stuff? And if you don't think that goes on, you've not been around the ministry very much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are guys that I believe are godly men who love the Lord, but they've been caught up in this and they've learned, and, uh, and I've said this before, uh, when, you go, when you're a young guy wanting to serve the Lord and you go into Bible college and you're thinking, hey man, how, I'll go starve in Africa. I just want to reach the world with the gospel. But you spend a little bit of time and you watch all the preachers come in and they're going out to that. Look, I'm not saying these things are inherently evil. I'm just saying, and you're watching and they get suits given to them and right. they're eating, you know, with this guy and they're driving nice cars and they got a big church and they give them these paid vacations and they give them all this. You start thinking as a young preacher boy, well, that's what success looks like. And if I become a preacher, that's how I know if I'm doing good or not. If I have all these things, well, you got a big problem there because you're not going to get those things and you're going to be like, either I'm a failure or God's not coming through for me. And you're going to turn and I've watched a lot of guys fall out of the ministry because it wasn't what their, their vision, you know, uh, that they had about what the ministry is about. But all of it kind of comes down to this last point. Look at verse seven. So we talk about uh, perversion, privilege. Oh, no. Revelation 18, verse 7. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she said in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And, shall, uh, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Amen. One of the reasons God's going to judge the world and the wickedness of this world, and again, we could be guilty of all these things, but praise the Lord, we're going to be out of this one because we are his people. We're covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. But the wickedness of this earth still exists, and it has to be judged, and he's going to pour out his wrath on this earth. And here's what we see, because this is the stem of it all. Pride. I sit a queen, right? This is the, the way that the devil did. If we go to Ezekiel, you'll see where he says, uh, you know, I will be as most high God. I will, and it's I, I, I. And every time somebody in the Bible is lifted up in pride, Solomon did the same thing. And he's like, I, I, I. That's all he's thinking about is himself and his own pleasures and what have you. And if you haven't noticed in the Bible, God doesn't like pride. <laughs> okay? I don't care what you put in front of it. Any pride parade is probably going to be wicked. <laughs> This is what caused Satan to fall. This is what caused uh, demons to fall. This is what caused many, uh, many men to fall today. And uh, pride, here's what pride is. Here's why God hates pride. Because pride attempts to take away the glory from God 
and put the glory on yourself. Right. Or, I'm, you know, so good. No, 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 you wouldn't have any of that if it weren't for God. You know, well, I'm special, I'm smart, I'm good looking, I don't, you wouldn't have any of that if it wasn't for God. And he could take that away from you in a moment, anything like that that you might have. And so, uh, so God disdains pride. He hates pride. Okay, uh, and this is why, by the way, this is why salvation can only be the gift of God. What does it say in Ephesians 2, 8, 9? For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself it is the gift of God. Not of works, why? Lest any man should boast. Amen. If you could get to heaven on your own works, guess what? You'd have something to be prideful about. But God hates pride, so I guarantee you that your works have nothing to do with getting you to heaven. Mm-hmm. Only way you can get to heaven is by throwing yourself at the mercy of God who died, right, to pay that price for you. And you say, God, thank you so much for that. I'm getting into heaven through your righteousness, not my own righteousness. That's all he wants. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He is only pleased Amen. when you put your faith in him and you bear fruit. But guess what? That fruit that you bear is something he provides. <laughs> he provides that spirit on, that allows you to be able to uh, bear fruit. John 15. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's right. So this is why salvation is uh, the gift of God. Now, the nations here are being judged. Look at verse 21 and 24. 21 says, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And now, before I read the last verse, why violence? What was, so how were they violent? By being prideful. You know, well, they're not harming anybody. They're just prideful. They just have pride. They're just happy with their uh, their wickedness. <laughs> what, what, how is that hurting anybody? Right? Isn't this an argument you hear in the world today? <clears throat> how does being, uh, uh, what was the word, privileged, right? What does that got to do with violence? Well, see, I already mentioned the end result of these things leads to a point where you put up, you put yourself above everybody else. And so what happens in this world at the end times with this one world government and what have you is that you see this time uh, we just got done reading all the chapters before this and we realized that the Christians were what, persecuted? Beheaded? You know, killed for their uh, uh, for, for not uh, following the, the Antichrist and you, you've heard all those stories. And what does it say in uh, verse 24? And in her was found the blood of of prophets and the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Okay, look, God has from day one been upset with the violence and the death and the killing of this earth. Jesus talked about that, how beginning at Abel all the way up to Zacharias. I mean, mean, all of these wicked people killed the prophets. Right? And they, they rejected them, and they killed them, and they killed Christ. you know. And so the violence is going to be repaid, and it's going to be repaid with violence. This is how God's going to ju- uh, judge. And I won't get into that, but the, the, uh, uh, this is what I'm preaching about tonight, and I owe oh, oh, Lord willing, we'll see. <laughs> I might change it. But, uh, but this, is, uh, this is the end result, is that God's going to judge this world with violence. And you say, well, I thought God hates violence. But here's the thing. When violence is enacted to repay violence, for instance, the death penalty upon somebody who kills a life, it makes sense. Right? You say, oh, if you're so much against killing, well, why would you kill the person who killed somebody? Because that's his just judgment. Now, that doesn't mean that I go around killing people because somebody else killed people. It just means because they killed somebody, the judgment has to go upon them. That's what God ordained. Okay? And so in the very end, what we see is God's going to judge the world through this mass kind of violence. We say, well, why would God cast fire down from the sky? And why would he kill all these people? And, and the blood's going to be up to the, the, the horse's bridle and all this kind of stuff. Why would he do that? Well, because he has been adding up all the bloodshed in this world from day one, and he's been keeping uh, uh, the prayers of all the saints and those who have been afflicted, those who have been uh, persecuted, and all this, for all this time, 
And he is going to pour his wrath out in the very end upon the earth for these types of things. Look at Ezekiel 16. When I think about those who are delicate and, uh, you know, what we talked about, uh, tender and all those kinds of things. And we talked about pride and we talked about that. And obviously the, I, the, the thought about the LGBT uh, agenda, the community and all that obviously comes up a lot. And so you would think about Sodom and Gomorrah and their wickedness. And everybody knows what sin uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was. I mean, the word sodomy comes from, you know, that the name of that nation, Sodom. What, what was God so uh, uh, disturbed by? With their wickedness, was uh, was their their actions there? However, here's what he says in Ezekiel 16. So I, I'm not denying that God was pouring out His wrath on that on that wickedness. Okay, but here's what he says in Ezekiel 16. Sorry. All right. Look at verse uh, 49. Behold. This was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy, and they were haughty, and they committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. God said, I saw it good to take these people out. Amen. Well, why? Because they were an abomination. Well, how did they get there? Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. Look, this has been the case of wickedness for every generation, every kingdom, every superpower on this earth has gone through that same cycle. And God says, I'm going to pour my wrath out upon the earth uh, for their violence and their wickedness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you that uh, we're saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and I pray that you would... Uh, uh, help us, since we are saved, to walk as Christians, to walk as believers, and and uh, serve you with our lives, which is our reasonable service, and that we would show a grateful, uh, by a grateful heart, Lord, uh, uh, we would show our good works to the world, that they might glorify uh, our Father, which is in heaven. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us not to fall into the traps. Uh, we can never lose our salvation, I believe that, but help us, Lord, as we are in this relationship with you, that we would never be distracted uh, by the things of this world and, uh, and the lust of the flesh and, and, and be distracted from those things. We would never get lifted up with pride and, uh, and that we would just continue to, uh, to seek your face and do your, your will. Help us not to fall into uh, any kind of perversions, whether it has to do with spiritual and doctrinal uh, type things or physical perversions. Lord, keep us out of help. Let's keep our garments uh, spotless uh, and, and keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. And I pray you bless this word and bless these people here. Uh, and we want to give you honor and glory for all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.